Hello, everybody. So I am Maxime Legal and uh, Antoine Lomel. Both we are student members of the NTT uh, student chapter in Bordeaux. And today it is uh, with a great pleasure that we welcome you for a virtual talk with uh, Dr. Uh, Charlotte Jackson about uh, 3D printing, micro design and the woodwind comes together. This talk is supported by the B branch and the NTT student chapter. Uh, just before, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Charlotte Jackson, to have you virtually uh, today. Just before, to, before I will shortly introduce you. Charlotte Jackson worked for North Top Krunman Aerospace Systems in Redondo Beach, California, as a senior staff member for the RF and the Mixed Signal Center. After receiving this doctorate at UCLA, he worked at JIRS, RIW, Ditrans, Arrington, and Northrop Grudman. While recovering from cancer, Charlie pursued a long life dream of designing and measuring the acoustic properties of woodwind musical instruments. He now used 3D printing to make them. Dr. Jackson retired from Northrop Grudman, where he supports space based programs. Charlie is a fellow of uh, I3E, has five patterns, and has published more than 30 uh, papers, articles. So, Doctor, it is a, a great pleasure to have you virtually today. So, the B floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, so, thanks for inviting me. I'd like to talk about um, 3D printing, microwaves, and woodwinds, and how they can come together. Here's a short abstract. Um, the outline is I'll talk about uh, Renaissance woodwinds, design equations, and 3D printing. Um, <clears throat> people have been making flutes for a very long time. Uh, a few number of years ago, a number of intact bone flutes were found in China, and they're in such good condition that people were able to play them. And they found bone evidence going back to Neanderthal times 40,000 years ago of uh, perhaps uh, flute-like instruments. <clears throat> uh, these were all designed without the aid of modern theory, and they also play a modern scale to first order. And I'll s explain why that is uh, briefly during the talk. If you were to lock me in a room with some rocks, some, some sharp sticks and some bones, I would starve before I could make a working flute. On the other hand, with um, modern design tools, I can design one um, and probably design one before I'd starve. Um, the 3D printing of this started a number of years ago. I went to the microwave symposium and SV Microwave gave out these cute little cell phone um, uh, gramophones, and it actually worked. It increased the sound a good three to six dB, uh, showing that, um, and the point of this is that it showed that 3D printing had finally reached a point which was good. Uh, I'm using a selective laser centering process from Shapeways, and um, <clears throat> um, that's the process I use. Shapeways has a number of different ones, and other uh, companies do. I don't own a printer, uh, so I'm following sort of like a fabulous semiconductor company. Um, if you go to the Shapeways slide um, site, they talk a lot about the different ones. So um, if you want more information, go to Shapeways or just Google things. Uh, I want to say that clubs have enabled me to realize my lifelong dreams. Uh, here are a number of clubs I've been involved in. I consider a conference to be a club. I consider MTT to be a club and uh, so on. But in each of these things, I learned how to work with people to get things done and um, many other skills. Uh, so here are the Renaissance woodwinds of interest. There's the flute, which um, uh, most of us are familiar with the orchestral modern bone flute. Recorder, a crumb horn, a cornetto, a sham, sagbut, or trombone, and a racket. Um, <clears throat> around the 1600, um, printing was really becoming a new thing, and an impressive book on woodwinds was made by this guy, Pretorius. 
these drawings of the different instruments of his day are so accurate that if you wanted to try to design one and build one, you could use these as a starting point. You see the scales on the bottom uh, actually give a good indication of the dimensions. The hole size is not there, but the location of the holes and the size of the instruments is there. Um, this is a blow up. And then this is sort of a um, version I have of the um, instruments I've made. Uh, you see on the left a piccolo-like instrument. Uh, you see these things with curves in them. They're crumb horns. You see the cone um, that's a cornetto, and then the one that has the um, lattice work is a sham. Uh, <clears throat> the Renaissance musical instruments had a limited scale. An octave and a half is somewhat typical. Modern instruments have almost three octave ranges typically, and they're able to play um, different ranges of um, dynamics, and um, they're able to play and do much better. Uh, here's a picture of a modern recorder. Box Brandenburg concertos were written for this instrument, and um, um, it's a very versatile instrument. Uh, it was pretty much replaced by the modern bomb flute, which is a chromatic instrument. Um, these Renaissance instruments are very suitable for applying the transmission line theory that I'll be talking about. So here's what it sounds like. Okay, here's a picture of a recorder club I'm in, uh, the Los Angeles Recorder Orchestra, and you can see that the instruments range from very small ones to very, very large ones. Um, here's a uh, interesting thing. For acoustics, the shape of the board doesn't really matter too much. It's really the cross-section that matters. So a square cross-section, octagonal or a round, are pretty much uh, the same. There's some modern instruments that um, don't have historic prototypes, and uh, you can see these U-turns in them. And one of the things I've been interested in is uh, simulating those and understanding how to model it. Um, but um, when the people started building these, they really just had to start from scratch and do cut and try methods to make things work. Uh, <clears throat> the flute. Um, the early, the Renaissance flute was actually uh, a cylindrical instrument similar to modern fives, and uh, the transverse flute um, was um, used. The modern flute is a chromatic instrument, meaning there's one hole for each note, um, and um, the modern instrument has a much bigger range, even tones, and good intonation. There are a lot of folk instruments out there. There's a Chinese folk instrument with a membrane. There's a Native American flute. And there are tin whistles uh, associated with Irish music. Um, they're similar to the recorder, but they actually have a cylindrical bore instead of a uh, reverse conical bore. <clears throat> the sham was the premier instrument of the Renaissance. It was very loud, much like a Barry saxophone today is very loud. The sham could fill up a, a Gothic cathedral and be heard. So a lot of people think it's a precursor of the modern oboe, and on one hand it is, and on the other hand it isn't. The acoustic circuit is totally different for the sham than for today's modern oboe. The uh, racket shown on the right side is about the size of an old-fashioned coffee ground can. Um, and it's in the same family tree as the bassoon. In fact, the picture there is the same acoustic length as a bassoon. It's just wrapped up uh, like a folded transmission line to fit it into that small volume. So here's um, what the sham sounds like. Uh, 
Um, the sham was um, a very loud instrument. You also saw there a sag butt or what we'd call a trombone today. Um, another thing that I've been doing is finding historical drawings that you can get from a museum and um, making uh, 3D copies of those instruments. Here's a picture of one that I'm testing to see how uh, well it works. The other instrument of interest is the uh, crumb horn. It's a bagpipe without a bag. Um, it's got a slight horn at the very bottom of that cylindrical tube, and it's got a narrow bore. It's a uh, capped um, double reed, uh, meaning there's a double reed in there and uh, that. I'm going to play one I have here, and I'll show it to you later on, but this is what they sound like. So it's got a very loud and buzzy sound. Um, the other instrument of interest is the cornetto. I like to call it the platypus of the woodwind family. You know, a French horn is part of a woodwind quintet, so it's always been a little bit of an outlier. Um, <clears throat> but the cornetto is similar to the horn with a brass mouth, mouthpiece, but similar to an oboe with uh, conical bore and holes. Um, and so it's a cross between what I'll call a brass instrument and a woodwind instrument. Here's a picture of our cornetto player. Uh, the cornetto was used up to 1650. It was actually playing music at that time that was also played on violins. And um, it's um, best known, I think, for music by Gabriele and San Marco uh, Venice. The brass mouthpiece on the, is on this instrument. A longer, larger, lower pitched instruments are called a lizard and the bass is called a serpent. And here's what these sound like. Sorry for the long intro. <laughs> Uh, so here are some pictures of some modern instruments. The one in the upper left is a modern version of a uh, serpent. These S-shaped things that were used uh, in the late Renaissance up through um, the uh, Victorian era. <clears throat> in the upper um, right, you see a picture of a serpent uh, that was owned by uh, the astronomer Herschel, and you see some of the other instruments he had. He was uh, an amateur musician and he led a local um, uh, uh, dance group, much like modern. some of uh, the people I know actually are in rock bands. It's just that's what the rock bands of the time were. The Lazard is about the same size as a didgeridoo, but the didgeridoo only really has one pitch. On the other hand, it uh, varies the sound quality, the waveforms and the sounds. and varies those much more than uh, one would do with a, um, a modern musical instrument. And again, the sag butt or trombone. The big difference uh, for the Renaissance ones where the bells were smaller, the metallurgy wasn't quite as good, and they did come in different sizes uh, from sub bass all the way up to um, uh, sopranos. Uh, I have a list of music uh, if anyone is interested. And uh, I have some links to different things that uh, you could watch or listen to. Let's now talk about the human ear. It's very sensitive. It can easily measure 6%, which is a semitone, a half step. Most musicians can hear to better than 1%. And um, because the way the ear works, uh, if you play two tones, uh, you can um, get things within a hertz. And that's what a piano tuner does. He plays two tones and he uh, gets them to be having no beats. The other thing is the human ear can hear about a 0.1 dB change in volume. And the human ear can also hear content. Um, 
spectrum analyzers and network analyzers typically measure easily to 0.1 dB. So the human ear, human ear is actually pretty good. Um, the human ear, though, is a nonlinear receiver. And for high volumes, you get inner mods. And if you work through the numbers, you'll see that the inner mods lead to the modern scale um, uh, that we hear. And that's why those uh, flutes from 9,000 years ago played what's basically a modern scale. And it's because the human ear um, generates tones uh, that uh, we fill in with the notes. Let's talk about designing instruments now. Um, <clears throat> The goal I've had was to be able to design an instrument that would allow a teenager to make a playable instrument, one that's good enough to play and might inspire them to learn how to play. Um, and on the other hand, one that's good enough to provide a starting point for a craftsman to refine an instrument and without the need for historical prototypes. <clears throat> Transmission lines have been around for uh, a long time. They were first um, realized uh, when uh, long telegraph lines were made and distortions were starting to appear. Um, it was a big part of communication theory for a number of and even for mission law are not um, given the attention they were a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> And let's think about some analogs between acoustical, electrical, and mechanical uh, things. Um, the mass of an object is basically the inertance, the volume is compliance, and a porous thing will give you resistance. Um, for electrical, you have resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And um, uh, we can see that that's there. The, other thing to consider is the vo velocity flow is like the current um, um, and much like a volume flow, the position is like the voltage and the pressure. Um, you can do nice um, uh, theories, but they only go so far. And um, you can't design a real working instrument using just simple, um, um, very simple models. Uh, and from my point of view, wearing a, a sort of a microwave engineer's hat, if I want to really simulate a woodwind, I'm going to need to do a brute force cascaded modeling, uh, which is similar to Keysight's ADS or AWR's microwave office. And that's what I'll talk about in a bit. So here's the way the woodwind model works. You have a tube with open holes and a, uh, a hole on the end. And if you want to change the resonant frequency, you would cover a hole. So those open holes are like short circuits to ground and a closed hole is like an open circuit. And so that would be what some equivalent circuits would look like. And you'd make an equivalent circuit for each pitch that you're looking at. The other thing is a small hole increases the pitch a little and a large hole increases it up to uh, a maximum point. And this trick has been used in, um, um, in orchestral music and other places. If you think of that um, Rhapsody in Blue, the clarinet glissando, what's happening is the clarinet player is taking one hole and he's uh, slowly opening it up to get this sort of continuous pitch change. So here are the equations. Um, again, for acoustics, the impedance is really easy. It's just rho C over S, rho the density C, the speed of sound, and S the cross section. <clears throat> Transmission lines have these uh, equations here for the impedance and admittance uh, as you're moving down for it. There's some nice um, approximations that you get when you have a short circuit or an open circuit and you're ignoring radiation. And these equations are basically the foundation. Um, the first time I did some real acoustical measurements, I was shocked because all the physics people and acoustics people said that uh, you could ignore radiation and loss. And um, you can't. You have to really pay attention to it. 
And there's some equations. I won't try deriving them and I won't actually describe them, but they're equations that are out there for um, the uh, impedance and resistance of um, a hole. And the point is, these would just be an equation, a circuit element when you're doing a simulation. Um, you need to know the impedance for um, a system. And, and um, in acoustics, again, um, the equation is very easy. It's uh, rho C over S. In um, um, microwaves, for instance, for strip line, you have a very simple equation for what the um, impedance is, which is similar. You have the square root of mu zero over uh, two epsilon epsilon zero H, uh, meaning the height and W being the width. <clears throat> um, but uh, in microwaves, you have fringing fields. So that simple equation, you have to actually um, bear down and do the, and do the math. And you see a, the pink line changes it. But the whole point here is you have um, a um, impedance uh, versus width or size that you can use to make your circuits. And um, I think many of you may have designed a very simple microstrip filter, a high Z, low Z filter. And uh, you can see what the microstrip version looks like at the bottom. And here you can see one that was designed uh, using um, manila folder paper. Um, it didn't work initially because uh, little holes cause a lot of problems. So I had to actually paint this with uh, a lacquer. And once I did that, I was able to uh, uh, get it to work. And you can see some uh, data from acoustic time domain reflectometry. Um, the red is the ideal and the blue is the measured. And from my point of view, I can see uh, two nulls, the frequencies off, but again, I didn't do any compensation for the um, transitions like one would do if one was designing a microstrip one. But basically, um, I just did this design with an equation for impedance versus width and uh, substituting the speed of sound for the speed of light. Talked about how I could measure the um, uh, impedance. And here you see uh, an experimental setup that I used. Um, you can see the laptop, which basically has uh, a very, very excellent A to D and D to A converter and some other things. And the way the acoustic time domain reflectometry works is the same way it does in microwaves, but uh, a pulse would be generated. It goes down a tube um, and then approaches a microphone, a sensor that measures the voltage or power. And then a, uh, there's a discontinuity, so you have an unwanted signal. You now hit the instrument and you get the signal you want and you get the thing. But you notice that unwanted signal is coming back. So you have to do time gating uh, to get rid of things. Um, but anyway, using this, uh, you can measure the acoustic impedance of the system. I wanted to talk here a little bit about uh, something. Here's a picture of an acoustic uh, rat race, uh, one at two kilohertz on the left and one at uh, one kilohertz, the white one. Um, and uh, the neat thing about uh, an acoustic rat race is you don't have to worry about mode matching. Uh, so you just come in and you can rotate it where you want. And um, here's the place where I demonstrated using earbuds early on that it does work as a hybrid, meaning that at the right uh, center frequency, uh, if I put in two equal tones, one of those output parts um, here will have no sound coming out and the other one will have twice the uh, sound coming out. And I do have to point out, um, why would anyone in the right mind do this? Well, I'm a microwave engineer at heart. And uh, why? Well, because it's there. You can do it and 3D printing makes it easy to do. Um, here I've uh, recently been looking at trying to do some uh, direction finding using um, these rat race hybrids. So this is what I call TRL technology readiness level one or two, um, showing how you can make 
on one hand an acoustic monopulse and on the other hand a Butler matrix for direction finding. So one thing that was a shock to me when I started doing this was imagine um, for the contrast of acoustics to microwave, imagine if your uh, lab today didn't have any matched loads, didn't have any standards for connectors, didn't have a flat oscillator source or detector. Imagine not even having a network analyzer and limited uh, numerical simulation tools. Well, that's what acoustical measurements are like today. There are some good points, though. There are a lot of uh, pretty good apps out there that can measure power, signals, generate signals, and um, do Fourier transform spectrum analysts. And again, the laptop is um, by far the best DDA and ADD you can get per your dollar. Um, what it does at acoustic frequencies would be equivalent to a high-speed digital scope that costs fifty to hundred thousand dollars. And all this was done so people could play video games. And then the other thing is you can hear the signals, so you know if if things are working at all. So here's a picture of uh, me testing a uh, 3db coupler, um, and you can see that. Um, these funny tubes have uh, foam in them because um, the impedance of a microphone and a um, detector is basically a open circuit. Um, and so it's got a huge mismatch. Um, and so anyway, you can see the directional coupler there. Um, when I tried doing... Um, antenna measurements, I ran into a problem. The leakage around my system to the device was um, was bigger than the signal I was measuring. Uh, so I needed to do, um, I needed to isolate the microphone uh, from uh, interference. So th there's a wooden box you can see in the picture there. You can see a branch line hybrid under test in this case. Um, what I had to do was uh, put the microphone inside the box. I'm using an iPhone as my power measuring, and uh, I had to get a camera, a Wi-Fi camera. And so I'm reading out the power using the uh, Wi-Fi camera going to the internet. Uh, but by doing this, I was able to get 30 dB of dynamic range, which is almost what is good enough to do some measurements. Um, but let's go back to transmission line um, approach here. So I want to find the impedance at each node along the way. Um, and I showed you the equations. And the one thing to remember is how to combine these circuit elements. I just use the parallel addition, 1 over z equals 1 over z1 plus 1 over z2. The other thing to keep in mind, though, for this uh, approach is that um, I want the impedance to be zero for reads, uh, like a double read or a clarinet uh, or something like that. And I want the impedance to be zero for a flute uh, or a recorder. So I'm going to get these impedance curves and then uh, find out what the pitch would be. So imagine here, here's a fingering called the F fingering. You can see the little um, breakout for the circuit there. And so what I start to do is I take that resistor and that little transmission line and I put them into a square box as an equivalent uh, one. And uh, then I combine those two and then I keep doing that until I have an equivalent circuit. Um, and then I uh, run a calculation, I calculate with that. Uh, for me, it all started with the TI-65. Um, that was a handheld calculator back in like 1972. It cost $200 then, which was a substantial portion of my summer earnings and uh, that. Um, but it's really hard to do the calculations. Uh, I decided to learn a programming language and I tried using that. I eventually got things to work using a um, spaghetti code um, in Excel. Um, and it was hard to do. I now use Octave or MATLAB um, to do it. MATLAB is, uh, well, Octave is an open source version of MATLAB in simple terms. Um, so it's under the new license.
So this would be what the output of the um, Octave program looks like. Um, there's fingerings on the left, and then it calculates what the frequency is. Um, F0 is what I want, F1 is what I calculate, and then I pay attention to the deltas and that. So I basically calculate for each of the fingerings um, the resonant um, here, and I find the peaks. Um, <clears throat> this summarizes what the dimensions are for one example. And um, here you can see the um, the blue diagonal line is what I want, and the red and the green diagonal lines are sort of like half-step um, intervals. And you can see that I'm within about um, uh, half a tone for the pitches. And uh, here you can see an example of a crumb horn that was designed this way. The early crumb horns I made before the 3D printing were done uh, you can see I used clear uh, lucite tubing. Part of the reason is a book called Horn Strings and Harmony that I read in high school made a uh, clear plastic uh, clarinet and flute. But you can see I'm using PVC um, tubing uh, to make the head cap. So here when I started, I just kept the center line, but then I realized that I could make the whole thing out of um, 3D printing and uh, it works a lot better. Here's one showing you can, keys can be done. There's the bro uh, disassembled um, Cornetto, not Cornetto, crumb horn to a historic uh, model. Um, this compares a historic uh, Cornetto to a 3D printed Cornetto. Uh, one thing I didn't anticipate is I can actually sell these instruments online um, um, you, using a Shapeway sh shop. Um, all the proceeds, if any, I've been giving to the American Recorder Society. There's no way I could make a profit on this um, stuff to warrant um, doing it. It's a hobby, but being able to turn some of my volunteer time into money for uh, the American Recorder Society is neat. Um, <clears throat> Let's start talking about things you can do and why you do them. Um, it turns out that um, 440 is our standard pitch, but there were a lot of instruments that were tuned to 415. And you'll see here that I can take a, a commercial inexpensive recorder and I can duplicate it uh, for the bore, but then I can tweak the design and use my equations to make one that's at a lower pitch. Part of the reason for doing this is that uh, in the Renaissance and Baroque, the pitch in one town was totally different from another. It tended to be tied to the local organ in the town. And the pitch could range over geography or time um, down by plus or minus half a step. There's a lot of instruments that were made at 415. These were um, woodwinds that were sort of like a Stradivarius instrument. Uh, you can play those with the string orchestra because everybody just tunes up half a step. But um, trying to play a woodwind instrument and transpose half a step is really hard. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So anyway, um, this is a way where one could make inexpensive um, um, instruments that could play with these historic instruments. Um, and I'll talk more about the costs in a bit. So here we go. Um, think of it, mass production um, can reduce the price um, quite a bit. And you can get down to, when you're making over 10,000 instruments, uh, you can get the cost for that recorder down to $10. Um, but uh, the initial cost, if you're only making one, would be prohibitive. Um, if you buy a 3D printer and make a part, uh, the cost of making the part is really dominated by the cost of the 3D printer. If you um, are doing what I do, which is sending my uh, drawing and sending my money to a place to get it made, um, it then is uh, like $100. So going back to that example I showed you a moment ago, the um, 
recorder at 415 using the 3D printing was about $50 or $100. If you were to have somebody make a part by scratch, a craftsman, it'd be anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 to make that part. So right there, the 3D printing is able to make an impact. And a big part of it is the custom um, ability. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, but I think that in the future, um, some uh, parts will be, you'll be like, think of a Dyson uh, vacuum cleaner. It's all vacuum, it's all th plastic parts. And if one got broken, I could imagine um, 3D printing a part to replace it. Um, and part of the reason this would work is you wouldn't need to have a storehouse to keep all the parts. You wouldn't have to have a distribution system. You could just put it on the web and distribute it that way. And this was adapted from a talk that Rick Smith gave. Um, a lot of people will ask, will 3D printing replace manufacturing? Well, um, not really. <laughs> um, think of it, think of books versus time. Um, there was a steady increase in the number of books as the number of people increased. Manuscripts were replaced by the printing press around 1400, but you'll still see people are doing handwritten things, calligraphy, wedding inv invitations and things like that. And nowadays the printing press is being replaced by the internet, but I think books are will be here to stay. There are other examples of this sort of thing. You know, there was the horse and buggy era that was replaced by the automobile. Um, people don't do a lot of home cooking these days. Um, microwave dinners are replacing it. Um, and another example would be a stagecoach was replaced by a train, which was replaced by the auto. Uh, the insight is that uh, 3D printing will be re um, prevalent when you have personalization or customization. Again, this is from Rick Smith. Um, so let's talk about how to do 3D printing. Um, and one thing to consider is you have to pay attention to the printer you're doing for your design. ABS baths are fairly common. You have um, the spigot ones and you have the powder nylon that I like to use. Printers vary and you need to design for the printer. We're not at the Xerox copier stage. A uh, typical wall thickness is uh, one millimeter. Typical hole diameter is one millimeter. Some printers need to have the support material designed in. And uh, one annoying thing with the um, powder nylon is that um, sometimes there's powder in the um, tube, so you have to clean it out. And it's really hard. I showed you a directional coupler. It's really hard to get the, the powder nylon out of that. Um, and the, sometimes you'll find blockage in AP, ABS things, uh, so you'll have to be able to ROM it out. And then keep in mind that the volume of material is proportional to the cost. I, I use OpenSCAD to draw the things, um, and uh, it's a program-oriented one. You can see um, how the commands that you do to draw the object. Um, OpenSCAD doesn't have good um, measuring tools, so sometimes I'll use MeshLab to view the thing and um, that. And then every now and then, um, the Drawings have some weird troubles with vertices not lining up and that. And so I use NetFab to repair for final printing. Uh, Shapeways now pretty much captures all these errors so, I don't, errors, so I don't need to do it as much today. There are some design projects to think of. You could write a um, digital filter code to calculate the sound wave for a given hole configuration. That's what modern synthesis synthesizers do. And you could um, calculate an MP3 thing with sounds and transients. Another one would be to take a Zigbee overlay and make what I'll call Zig A acoustic. And um, you can remember that human ear um, stops at about 15 kilohertz and for some people my age it's around 10 kilohertz so if you have a pitch that's higher than that um, children can hear it but adults can't you could use OOK, QPSK or ultra wide band to do the acoustic portion of the link and you could 
do some funny things. You could um, redesign a bass flute using a spiral approach to reduce the length and make it so you don't need that YouTube. Um, just point out other applications of 3D printing. I replaced my mercury thermostat from the 60s and um, with a, uh, a Nest temperature controller, but it had a problem. The hole was too big uh, for me to mount the uh, uh, instrument. So I printed a background. You can see that round thing there. Uh, another thing is solar cookware. Um, a little short on time. And then here, uh, this was a bookend dated from 1930. It was a wedding gift from my grandparents. I was planning on learning how to do uh, uh, lost wax uh, metal casting, but I realized that me and a hot molten metal isn't necessarily the best thing. And using a um, 3D imager, I was able to make a 3D uh, copy of the bookend. Anyway, um, I'm going to read my conclusion and then I'm going to uh, show you some of the instruments here. Um, but anyway, 3D printing has enabled my dream of building Renaissance instruments and designing them with equations. Uh, basically, I'm using microwave theory of transmission line and just the philosophy of breaking things up. And uh, with 3D printing, these actually work. So let me stop sharing. And let's see if I can turn on the camera again. Turn camera on. There we go. So here's the um, crumb horn I played a while back. My cats decided <laughs> to join me. Wonderful timing, cat. And then here's a picture, not a picture, here's a uh, version of a 3D printed um, uh, um, rat race hybrid. The idea is that you have two ports here where you put in signal A and B, and out here on this side, you'd get A plus uh, B and A minus B. Uh, here's a sham that you can see, and I have this uh, lattice work like the Eiffel Tower, but the reason for that is so that when I hold it, it feels like it's solid, but I can reduce the volume by a good, um, uh, I can reduce the volume to 10%. <clears throat> the other neat thing though, is you can um, play here. So here you see, I've done the same idea of having a, a, a trellis, but this one is shaped like uh, the DNA. So, and on the other hand, it's sort of like a wave going down. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can do a lot of artsy things with it. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to um, end the talk and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. It was a very interesting talk. So now, if you agree, we can continue with uh, 10 minute questions. If we have online, do not hesitate to ask your, your question. I don't know if we will uh, check online, but first I have a, a, a quick question. Uh, you present uh, numerous uh, instruments such as uh, oboe, uh, clarinet, bassoon, and uh, like, for example, piccolo, is the way of uh, trying to design uh, this kind of instrument in 3D printer uh, include the uh, the input for the for the, the I don't know how to say that properly, but uh, the whether the the musician the musician sorry is um, uh, breathing on the instrument. I will try to to explain myself. But when the musician is breathing on the instrument, uh, the input for the the, the, the breath is not the same on all this kind of instrument. So is there a way uh, of modelize it or uh, do you, uh, are you not considering it on the, on your modelization? So the model I'm using is um, a very simple sort of model where I'm ignoring the actual mouthpiece um, and the armature of the performer. <clears throat> um, but 
if you get the design so the uh, pitches are where are close to where it is, then the uh, person who's playing has ways to adjust the pitch a little bit to make it be in tune. The um, on the other hand, there's a lot of digital modeling that you can do, and one of the project I, I mentioned was to uh, simulate that. You can make a model for the airflow, the uh, pressure that goes in, um, and for how the reed works, uh, which could be the lips of a brass player or the reeds. And so you can actually, uh, with that, you can simulate. You'd actually use the same numerical model I talked about in that um, digital simulation, but you would add in how the uh, mouthpiece works and interacts with the circuit. Okay. Hope that answered the. <clears throat> Uh, we, we have a, a question on, online from uh, Jean Charles. Uh, he asks you if you have, you have you ever tried to metallize one of your projects? Uh, hang on a second. My cats have decided to fight, so I'm going to let one out of the room here. Uh, so I couldn't hear you hear the question over the cats. What was the okay. question? I will repeat it. Uh, Jean Charles from IMS Lab uh, asks if you have ever tried to metallize one of your 3D printing. Um, I haven't, um, but um, if one wants to do actual microwave measurements using 3D printing, um, by getting like paint, Google see which paints work could take a uh, you know you know pyramidical horn um, that you could use um, as part of um, a system you could um, uh, make a filter uh, the same way where you would metalize it so some ham radio operators have been doing that where they will make a plastic circuit they'll metal and again, from radio operators, that's really good because making buying a filter that does what you want can be very expensive. Um, these would be cheaper and not as good. Um, but it uh, does mean that one could, for instance, design a cavity filter and waveguide using 3D plastic printing, metalize it, and then see how the design came out. Um, the 3D metal printers are coming along. Uh, it's um, pretty expensive to go through Shapeways, but if you're at an institution like a uh, university, you can get these um, metal printers. And the surface finish, the accuracy, and all those things are constantly getting better. Uh, I think right now they're good enough to, for instance, make a directional coupler. Uh, but making a filter that didn't need tuning, I don't think we're there. But um, <clears throat> at Northrop, uh, if I'm making a machine filter, we still need tuning screws because we had very, very uh, tight performance specs. And so we still needed to do tuning screws. So um, I was constantly trying to convince people that we could do 3D printing to make some of our filters because we're doing tuning screws. But um, you know, a lot of people are stuck in their old ways. So, <laughs> you know, another question that comes up a lot of times is, um, you know, if I show you this guy here, it's got a slight surface finish. It's not perfectly smooth. And people will say, well, wouldn't wood be better? Because that's what the real instruments are. Or wouldn't metal be better for these instruments? And, um, you remember the enemy of uh, of how do I put it? The enemy of good enough is better. So these the three the laser printing that I'm using right now has a slight roughness, which is similar to wood, and it's good enough. Um, for um, other things, it uh, um, Other thing to remember is that, that filter I showed you was made with just paper. So you, the thickness of the material doesn't matter too much um, because 
it's so much more dense than air. Thank you. And uh, we, we, we have uh, another question. Um, the fact is that when you are uh, printing the, the instrument, the thickness of the, uh, the, the, the structure is not uh, completely the same uh, compared to wood wild instrument. Does it, um, th does it have an influence on the sound or maybe on the, 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 the air resistance uh, for, for the musician, for the, the person who tried to play with it? Um, no, uh, it goes back to what I was saying. Um, if you have like a mill of plastic uh, versus a centimeter of plastic, um, as far as the air propagating or the vibration, uh, it isn't really going into it. If you have a um, instrument like say a French horn and you're blowing into it, you can actually feel the waves going through if you touch the bell or the instrument. But that's um, a very, very small part of the energy involved. Okay. Um, if you, in order to see real problems, you'd have to get even thinner. There's a Chinese flute where they take a thin membrane and put it over a hole. And that very thin membrane, like scotch tape, um, um, vibrates. So when the sound goes through, but because it's vibrating, it then causes a clipping of the waveform. Mm -hmm. And you can actually get a square wave out of that uh, um, tooth, like that thin membrane, like a fraction of a mil. It's um, a problem. But once you get up to about a tenth of a mil, it's thick enough, not a tenth of a, a, tenth of a millimeter, it's thick enough to... Uh, contain the acoustic waves. Okay. Um, in a way, it's related to if you know any professional flute players, you'll find that they have heated arguments about whether a silver plated flute is better than a gold plated flute. And maybe maybe they can really tell the difference. But um, if you were to have someone, if you were to have somebody play a um, 3D printed flute, the acoustic, I mean, the gold and the silver behind a screen. I'm not sure people could tell the difference. Okay. Uh, maybe we, we have time uh, for a last question. I don't know if we have on in the chat. Okay, so I will uh, ask the, the, the last question. Uh, on your presentation, you speak about a wood wine, wood wine sorry, instrument. And also about uh, um, trombone and uh, um, metal instrument, I would say. But for um, your modelization, you are using a uh, hole. And when you when you put the finger on it or not, we are going to have a short or open circuit. Uh, does uh, this have an equivalent for the the trombone where there is no hole at all? No hole. Yes. Yeah. So for the trombone, the beauty of it is you have the bell, and the bell will have a radiation impedance, and mm -hmm. that radiation impedance is constant. So it gives, a, you know, like an equivalent um, additional length. So really here, you just have a very simple transmission line, and the length of it is what you change. So for mm -hmm. the trombone, it's, it's very easy to to do the calculations. And uh, again, going back to the idea of doing a digital simulation, the trombone um, um, becomes very easy because you really just have to worry about the model for your, your digital model for the bell and then mm -hmm. the transmission line. It's the same diameter the whole way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do not have uh, any question left. Maxim, I don't know if you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we will end the, the, the talk here. Thank you very much for your okay. kind presentation and really interesting presentation. And also, uh, we have shown it in one video for your musician skills. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, if you have another things to share with us for another talk, do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, it will be with a real pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you.